dear students today we will be discussing about geothermal energy and its fundamental working principle and applications also at the end we will discuss about the advancement of the technology so primarily we will be covering the energy harvesting methods and applications thermodynamic cycles then advancement in the development so geothermal energy comes from the greek words geo and therme which means earth and heat that's a earth heat so it makes use of a massive underground storage of thermal energy under the surface of the earth so the worldwide distribution profile of geothermal resources is primarily focused in three zones first is circum pacific belts west coast which includes australia west indonesia the philippines japan china and taiwan and then mid atlantic ridge which spans northern end of iceland and mediterranean to the himalayan region which includes italy and tibet so we can also have a look about the ring of fires it appears like horseshoe it is quite wide and very long wide is about 500 km so most of the volcanoes are occurring in this belt and we can see the probable installation of geothermal plant near to this unit and near to this ring of fire so we can have a look about the global geothermal sites so all together about 16 gigawatt of power till 2020 has been harvested by utilizing geothermal energy and almost 35 countries use this energy for thermal applications and about 21 countries geothermal energy is used for electricity generation we will discuss the methodologies by which we can use it for thermal as well as electrical energy generation as far as sites for potential plants in india is concerned we have himalayan belts like sumthang the sara valley then sonatie lineman belt then puga mohanadi basin the west coast and the godavari these are the potential sites for installation of geothermal plant in india let us have a look about the history so this geothermal energy used for bathing in paleolithic times the ancient romans used it as a central heating system for bathing and heating homes and floors in 1892 america's first district heating system put into place and then in 1904 first geothermal plant was installed in italy place is lord lerlo so today you can see the same plan is something like this at italy now let us have a look about the heat from the art center as we know our art comprises of this many components if we dig it we have inner core outer core mantle then sometimes we can say lower mantle and upper mantle and crust so what happens our core maintains temperature in excess of 5000 degrees celsius here and heat energy continuously flows from hot core by conduction convection and radiation heat transfer phenomenon 
the heat flux at earth surface is about 16 kilowatts per square kilometers which is nothing but the heat energy is released and dissipate to the atmosphere and space and it tend to be strongest along tectonic plate boundaries and volcanic activity transports hot material to near the surface of the earth. So, small fraction of molten rock actually reaches the surface and most is left at a depth of about 5 to 20 kilometer beneath of the earth surface. Hydrological convection forms high temperature geothermal system at shallow depth of 500 to 3000 meter that is 0.5 to 3 kilometer. Okay. Now, let us learn about earth temperature gradient and heat versus depth profile. So, if we go deeper and deeper, so profile of temperature will be something like this. To be precise, we can have this kind of plots. So, if we again take out say up to 500 kilometer, so it appears something like this lithosphere, then asthenosphere. So, what are things there in the lithosphere? What are things there in the asthenosphere? We must know. Then we understand how this heat is transferred from the earth core to the surface and then how these femorals are generated, how these fissures are generated. So, that we must understand properly in order to harvest the geothermal energy. So, this earth crust is about 70 to 100 kilometer thick and it also varies if we consider in the continent and if we consider in the ocean bed. So, if we consider in the ocean bed, then it will be thinner compared to the continental. So, continental is about 20 to 65 kilometer thick and ocean is about 7 kilometer. And here this mantle we can also classify in two parts like this is upper mantle, upper mantle and then we will have lower mantle. The crust and upper mantle which is 100 kilometer below the separating crust. So, here this is the earth crust and then there is separation in between. So, this is something like we have this is maybe earth crust and then this is separating layer. Then we will have this is upper mantle, lower mantle, this is separating layer between earth crust and upper mantle. So, these two combines this lithosphere okay. and then lower mantle extending up to 2900 kilometer below the earth surface is asthenosphere. So, this is actually asthenosphere. Okay. So, when we are talking about geothermal energy, we cannot drill it to a very long distance. So, up to a maximum of 10 kilometer we can do based on the availability of the technology and resources at the moment. Okay? But we must know how this temperature is sensing when we go deeper and deeper. Okay? So, at the core as you know it is more than 5000 degree Celsius and also you can see the gradient how it varies with the layers inner core then outer core then we will have mantle and then earth crust. Okay. So, these profiles are important while harvesting geothermal energy. So, now let us discuss something on geothermal field which is nothing but geothermal resources. So, it is something like a boiler which is under the earth crust. Right? So, we have 
crystalline rocks because when we when we say in the crust what we will get we will get crystalline rocks ok. We will have water bodies say for example, we have water bodies which are trapped under pressure. So, these are cracked maybe rocks or porous rocks and these are trapped and if they get some suns to flow then what we will get like femorals and other water with gases will come out and this water actually heated up from the magma and these are stored in the rocks and this from rocks heat is exchanging to the water bodies which is trapped under the earth crust and if there is some cracks and some kind of holes then this steam and water actually come up through the small or narrow channels and you will see like a streams is flowing ok. So, in order to get this potential that is heated water because this temperature might be 350 which is something like maximum temperature reported in the literature. So, that maximum temperature we can get it by facilitating an arrangement to get the steam or mixture of steam and water to run turbines to get electricity. If the temperature is low then we can use the hot fluid for thermal applications ok. That is how it is shown here this is the boiling region hot water and low density this is the cold water it is something like rain also we can consider. So, cold water comes through rains and then it goes in and this will be stored in the water bodies and because of this heat transfer from the magma and the stored energy in the rocks it will transfer heat and then water will be converted to steam and then this can be utilized for power generation or any other applications. So, if there is a crack so we can have some kind of hot springs femorals which is visible in those places where geothermal potential is existing. Also we can have a look about uh, temperature and the depth. So, there are five different cases are discussed in this plot. So, if we consider one which is nothing but average gradient is about 30 degree Celsius per kilometer. So, as you go deeper and deeper we can have higher in temperature which is shown by this dotted line 1 and indicated by 1. And in case of 2 increase in boiling point of water due to rise in pressure. So, boiling point will increase because of rise in pressure which is indicated by this dotted line. In case of 3 the temperature of water is upflowing spring. So, this is also increasing with the depth and impermeable rock insulates geothermal reserve sometimes water bodies is below the hard rock and that temperature is really very very high ok. So, if you consider that case so it will be something like increasing temperature with depth. So, it will be increasing up to 300 sharply then steadily it is increasing. In case of 5 that is leak in rocks to create springs of hot water or steam geysers. So, if some streams some cracks are there so hot stream will come up in case of geysers or springs. So, their temperature is more or less constant as you go on increasing the depth. So, now we must know the different geothermal energy sources 
like natural stream reservoirs, then geopressurized reservoirs, then hot water reservoirs. Okay? And you can see these hot springs, then geysers. So, these are the small channels created and you can see the geysers and then fumaroles here. And as far as resource is concerned, we can have hydrothermal. So, it may be hot water or with steam. So, if it is hot water, temperature is less than 100 degrees Celsius and if it is wet steam, then it is above 100 degrees Celsius and we have geopressurized resources. We can get up to a temperature of 160 degrees Celsius, then vapor dominated resources, we can go up to a temperature of 350 degree Celsius. Hot dry rock resources, its temperature is about 650 degrees Celsius and magma resources will be very, very high like 700 to 1600 degrees Celsius. So, these are the resources of geothermal energy. So, now if we have to tell about the utilizations, so we can have two major classes like low temperature reservoirs and high temperature reservoirs the energy utilization strategy strongly depends on the reservoir temperature. So, once we know the reservoir temperature, then we can prescribe which technology to be used for generation of electricity or thermal energy. As far as direct utilization is concerned, the geothermal energy can be applied for space heating district heating, heat pumps, then refrigeration, then greenhouse and many more such kind of applications where hot water is required at certain temperature. So, concept of district heating goes something like this because heat has to be transferred from the brine solution what is coming from the geothermal well and that has to be exchanged with water and that water will be circulated. So, we can see here this is city water is to be heated, this is the cold water and this hot water need to be distributed. So, here what is done hot geothermal water is pumped and then heat exchange will be there with the cold water and then in other side geothermal water will be taken out and reinjected to the wells. And you can see here use of geothermal energy in greenhouse and under the greenhouse we will have lot of vegetables and this picture is for heat pumps. So, we can use heat pumps because we need to provide hot stream at the exit. Okay? So, we need to provide some kind of energy to work and then we can provide stream at certain temperature. And in case of indirect utilization, we are primarily focusing on electricity generation. The geothermal power plants are much less efficient than nuclear or fossil fuel based power plants. Because if we see in case of fossil fuel based power plant, the working temperature at the inlet is about 540 degrees Celsius and pressure is also very, very high. But here we can go up to a temperature of 250 degree Celsius. So, if you calculate the Carnot cycle efficiency, which will be very, very less in case of geothermal power plants compared to coal based power plants or nuclear based power plant. This is one of the concern. The steam cycles are used for high temperature reservoirs and binary circles are for low temperature reservoirs. Right? And also we can see here the method of heat extraction, okay? borehole heat exchangers, then hydrothermal systems, then dry rock. You can see here these are the porous rocks, you can drill it cold water and hot water can be utilized. So, this is the heat extraction from thermal ground water. So, cold water comes and hot water goes out. And 
if we talk about geothermal energy conversion systems, primarily we have dry stream when geofluid is superheated vapor and approximately 20 percent of global geothermal power generation capacity is based on dry system and the cheapest and more efficient among others. And single flush which is about 42 percent of the global geothermal power generation capacity uses it and about 19 percent of global geothermal power generation capacity is double flushed. I will explain what is dry stream, single flush, double flush and binary cycle. So, in case of binary cycle about 24 percent of the global geothermal plants are binary cycles. So, as far as geothermal utilization is concerned for thermal you can see this is for blue color is for year 2020 and uh, one is for geothermal heat pumps. So, geothermal heat pumps is really increasing that means, utilization of geothermal heat pump is really increasing compared to 2015 in 2020 and two indicates bathing and swimming, three indicates space heating, four indicates greenhouse heating, five aquaculture pond heating and six industrial. So, you can see the applications and you can see the rise in utilization of geothermal energy. And for power plants the kind of technology used is also shown here it is like single flush, dry stream, double flush, triple flush and binary. Okay. So, when we are talking about geothermal power generation, so primarily it has got two classes vapor dominated resources and liquid dominated resources. So, under liquid dominated resources again we have flush steam system if the temperature of the brine solution or stream coming out from the geothermal well is more than 175 degrees Celsius and we will suggest binary cycle if the temperature is below 175 degrees Celsius and hot water system ranges from 20 to 150 degrees Celsius based on the applications. So, in case of vapor dominated system or vapor dominated resources what happens? The stream what is coming out from the well mostly steam will be there. So, that can be directly expanded in a turbine before cleaning if some gases or some unwanted materials are coming that has to be cleaned by using say clean separator or maybe some other technologies. Then that can be introduced in the turbine for generation of electricity. That means, we can use Rankine cycle in that case for generation of electricity. But in case of liquid dominated system we need to have some kind of technology which generate steams because in a well water and steam will be mixed. So, in order to get more steam then we need to do some kind of flushing because at the surface pressure will reduce and then the vapor generation will be high. So, we can produce steam by doing flushing. So, that technology we can have to adopt to generate steam then we can expand in the turbine for generation of electricity. And sometimes we can use secondary fluid to exchange heat from the fluid what is coming out from the well to the secondary fluid and that will expand in a turbine and that will work in a closed loop. And sometimes we can use it for direct application like district heating or maybe aquaculture and all. So, if we talk about dry steam power plant it looks something like this. So, this is the production well it comes here sometimes we need to install one device called cyclone. So, it will separate some kind of solids if it come out from the production well and only steam will be permitted to introduce in the turbine and then turbine will rotate and electricity will be generated 
electro degenerator and then steam has to be condensed by using a cooling tower and then this will be again injected to the well. Okay. So, dry steam extracted from natural reservoirs having temperature range 180 to 225 degree Celsius and pressure is about 4 to 8 mega Pascal and we can have 200 kilometer per hour is the rate and steam is used to drive the turbo generators and steam is condensed and pumped back to the ground and it can achieve about 1 kilowatt hour per 6.5 kg of steam and a 55 megawatt plant requires about 100 kg per second of steam. This is data so that you can visualize the kind of the amount of steam required for generation of 1 megawatt of electricity. Okay. So, single flush steam power plant looks something like this. We have steam which water extracted from the ground and pressure of mixer drops at surface and more water flushes to steam. So, here this is the steam and brine. So, here flushing is done. Okay. So, it will separate brine and steam then steam goes up and expand in the turbine and also you can say turbo generator we can generate electricity and then we need condenser and then finally, this brine and then condense it goes together to the injection well. Okay. And the some amount of heat we can use it for district heat as well. Okay. This steam separated from the water and steam drives the turbine and turbine drives an electric generator and it generates between 5 to 100 megawatt and it uses 6 to 9 tons of steam per hour. Okay. So, in case of binary cycle what happens we need to have secondary fluid. Okay. So, here like isobutene whose boiling point is about 10 degree Celsius is used because this is at somewhat lower temperature. So, low temperature operation 100 degree to 150 degree Celsius. Okay. So, it goes through this pipe from the production well and then heat exchange will be there with this secondary fluid and then it will generate vapor and vapor will be expanded in the turbine and generate this couple. So, electricity will be generated and then we need to condense it okay, and this will work in a closed loop. right? And condenser may be air condenser or may be cooling tower like uh, water based. Okay. And this after heat exchange takes place then then brine solution with water goes to the reinjection well or maybe injection well. So, what kind of organic fluid is used? Isobutene or maybe isopentene. Okay. So, as I said the use vapors to drive the turbine and then it condenses and then it recycle continuously and its efficiency is somewhat lower it varies from 7 to about 12 percent and uh, we can go up to a 40 megawatt of this kind of capacity from a single unit. Here what is shown is nothing but a double flush power plant. So, here what happens this is the first flush and then this is the second flush. Okay. So, from production well this steam and water comes in and then it flushes. So, steam will be generated brine will come down because it is heavy and steam is lighter it goes out and then it will expand the first turbine and then same brine again it is flushes to get steam out of it and that steam again expanded in the second turbine to generate more power. Okay. 
and rest of the cycle is same. Okay. So, here condenser is there and then we have cooling towers and then it is injected to the well and some of the heat is utilized for district heating. Okay. So, it also uses exhaust from the first turbine. So, this can also be done, uh, this is connected anyway, but this exhaust, this is shaft which is connected to the second turbine, but now this is the exit. So, there is a heat exchange between the exit here and uh, this will now increase the temperature of the inlet of the steam and that will maximize the efficiency. So, that is how we can have efficiency in the range 20 to 25 percent in this configuration. Of course, it will increase some kind of cost, but efficiency is found to be superior compared to other technologies. Also, we have hot dry rock technology. It requires drilling to a depth of 3 to 6 kilometer into crust of hot crystalline rock formations and water pumped into the formations. So, you can see here this is the cold water pumps and uh, water flows through the natural fissures picking up the heats. Then this is the heat and heat exchange will be there and then, then through pumps again this will be coming up and then once it is there then we can have the technology available and we can harvest electricity the way we have discussed in the previous slides. Also combined cycle plants are available like combining conventional steam turbine technology with binary cycle technology. So, there what happens steam drives primary turbine and remaining heat is used to create organic vapor and organic vapor drives a second turbine. And this kind of plant can be built more than 100 megawatt capacity. Of course, we can make it 10 megawatt as well, but we can go beyond 100 megawatt capacity. And here we will get very good efficiency because we are utilizing the exhaust heat in the second case and the first case we are working with high temperature ends. So, it will be something like higher overall utilization and extract more power from geothermal resources. What are different thermodynamic cycles used? Rankine cycle and Stirling cycle. So, here we need a boiler where steam is generated and is expanded in the turbine and this is coupled to a generator to generate electricity and then we need a condenser to condense the steam to produce water and that water has to be pumped and this will work in a loop. And if we are interested about TS diagram, it looks something like this, this is the vapor dome and we have heat supplied, then expansion, then we have condenser and then pumping. Right. And here in Stirling cycle, we have two reversible isotherms and two reversible isocores. That means two temperatures, temperature is constant, this is maybe Th, this may be Tc. So, Th is greater than Tc and then other is constant volume process, this is constant temperature process, this is constant temperature, this may be Th and this may be Tc. Okay. So, we can analyze this styling engine what happens like if we consider like uh, isothermal heat addition it will be something like this. Then we will have 2 to 3 is something like uh, isochoric heat removal. Then 3 to 4 is isothermal heat removal, then 4 to 1 is the isochoric heat addition. Okay. So, these are the different processes 
and then we will have uh, the configuration something like hot reservoir here you can see based on the moment of the piston because we have external source of heating and then some fluid will be there inside like helium it will expand okay that is where the expansion process and then we will have this is compression. So, you can see like cycle efficiency calculation we need network and net heat. So, this is heat. So, once we know this then from that we can calculate what is efficiency. So, this is work done network done to the heat supplied. And if we are interested about say complete TS diagram I mean just or maybe PV diagram. So, this will be something like this. So, 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay. So, here this may be TH and this may be T C, T H greater than T C. Also, we can draw T S diagram. So, it will appear something like this. This may be 1, 2, 3, then we have 4. And this is volume is constant because we have two reversible isocores means is constant volume and this is constant temperature. Two reversible isotherms means constant temperature okay. and this may be at T 1 or T H and this may be T 2 or maybe T C or maybe T H. Okay. So, if we consider 1 kg of ideal gas then q 1 to 2 will be how much it will be like w 1 to 2 which will be r t 1. So, you can follow this as well ln of v 2 by v 1 and for isochoric heat removal this q 2 to 3 will be minus C v T 2 minus T 1 where W 2 to 3 will be 0 and for isothermal heat removal 3 to 4 to be W 3 to 4 will be minus R T 2 ln V 3 by V 4 and isochoric heat addition will be Q 4 to 1 which is equal to C V T 1 minus T 2 is W 4 to 1 is equal to 0. Due to heat transfer at constant volume process the efficiency of styling cycle is less than the efficiency of Carnot cycle. right? But if we consider a regenerative arrangement then what we consider like Q 2 to 3 is equal to Q 4 to 1. Under this condition the efficiency of the Stirling cycle will be same as the efficiency of Carnot cycle. Okay. So, regenerative Stirling cycle is same as Carnot cycle right? and also we can write this efficiency is R T 1 ln of V 2 by V 1 minus R T 2 ln of V 3 by V 4 to R T 1 ln of V 2 by V 1 which is nothing but 1 minus T 2 by T 1 or 1 minus T C by T H. This T's are has are to be in Kelvin. Okay. Right. 
So, we can also solve a small problem if we use this Stirling engine for geothermal power production. So, let us consider a case where geothermal plant need to be used and Stirling cycle is suggested. So, geothermal water delivers at 250,000 kg per hour and outlet temperature from well and average operating temperature are 90 degree Celsius and 24 degree Celsius respectively. We need to calculate heat supply to the plant, then power available and then electricity production if total working hours is 700 per month and a specific heat of brine is also given to us. So, its solution goes something like once we know this temperature 90 and 24, then we can find out what is delta T. Delta T is 90 minus 24 which is equal to 66 degree C. Okay. Then we can calculate the heat supply which is nothing but mass of water which is coming out from the well which is not steam because its temperature is less than 100 degree Celsius C p of water and then delta T. So, it is 250 thousand multiplied by 4.18 then delta T is 66 okay. and this is something like kg per hour multiplied by kilojoule per kg per degree Celsius or Kelvin is fine and then we have centigrade this goes fine this is kg per hour. So, in order to convert this to second because we want in kilowatt. So, we have to divide this entire expression by 3600. So, then it will be of something like 19158.33 kilowatt. Okay. This is joule per second is what? Okay, and this will be thermal, right? So this heat supply QS will be something like this. So in the second case, we need to find out the power available. So for this, we first need to calculate Carnot efficiency. This can be written as eta C 1 minus T C by T H. So, this is 1 minus and this temperature has to be in Kelvin. So, 24 plus 273 and 90 plus 273. So, this will be something like 18.18 percentage. So, once we know this, we also know this eta C again we have work done or what is delivered this P I can write Q S. So, P will be something like eta C multiplied by heat supply. So, this is 0.1818 multiplied by 19158.33 which is equal to 3483.33 kilowatt electrical. Okay. So, this is the power available and for C in order to calculate electricity production then we need to multiply with the working hours. right? So, electricity production
E will be P multiplied by the time which is nothing but 3483.33 multiplied by 700. Okay. So, this will be is equal to about 2438332.9 kilowatt hour. Okay. So, that is how we can get it. So, if it delivers at this flow rate and if working hour is 700 hours per month, then electricity production will be this many kilowatt hour per month. Okay. So, we can also extend our calculation for yearly and if the uh, unit is running for say 25 years that also can be calculated how much electricity will be generated under this condition. Now, let us discuss about the advanced geothermal systems like integrated geothermal system. It means hybrid solar geothermal plants are well researched. However, there is a considerable amount of research in the system that uses geothermal technology paired with biomass, hydrogen production, thermoelectric generators and cogeneration with additional fresh water production. So, people are giving more emphasis on hybridization of technologies, so that efficiency of the entire plant can be maximized and we can optimize the utility of the system. So, what are advantages we will get by using geothermal power plant? It requires lower land compared to wind and solar technologies. Geothermal plants use less fresh water than conventional power plants. Reliability is very good, no influence of surface weather conditions. It will create local job opportunities. It has got disadvantages as well. As we have discussed, its operating temperature range is not so high, so its conversion efficiency is lower. And higher investment is required as compared to solar and wind energy conversion systems. Silica scaling is one of the major problems for foulings in different components of the plants and risk of geological changes like uh, pumping fluid into fractured rock can create seismic disturbances and risk of hydrothermal eruption when pressure in the geothermal aquifers near the surface reach a critical level and eject the surface material above it then it is a matter of concern for hydrothermal eruption. So, these are the disadvantages associated with a geothermal power plant. There are environmental impacts like uh, vegetation losses, soil erosion, then landslides and also slight air heating and local fogging. Then we have reservoir cooling, then seismology is also one of the concerns. In case of water, water said impact, then dumping streams, hydrothermal eruption, then lower water table and subsistence, also noise. So, as we said noise, noise is a one of the problems associated with geothermal power plant, but if we talk about overall performance and if you consider all the aspects, we can say this technology is benign, we can use this technology for power generation. 
that means it is a sustainable technology. So, there are installations of geothermal power plant in India and uh, many of the installations are from India like uh, Tata Power, then Thermex, NTPC and other power plants. So, we have plants like 5 megawatt in Gujarat and uh, like Khamam district in Andhra Pradesh there is a plant and in Himachal Pradesh 60 megawatt plant which is installed by Pengs Geothermal. So, India is also promoting to install geothermal plants which is seen from this table, but as you know we need a specific location for installation of geothermal plant. So, that big plant we need to explore for India. So, these are references we have used for preparing this presentation and you can summarize what we have discussed today. Primarily, we have discussed the geothermal principle and working and its classifications and when to use what technology and what are the operating conditions of those technologies. In overall, geothermal appears to be sound solution to energy needs. Geothermal energy has the ability to expand few environmental effects which has been discussed and it is a very cost effective technology because we do not have to use any fuel for burning because we are getting steam from the ground. So, no fuel cost and that is how it is very efficient. And uh, overall if you see all the aspects geothermal is renewable. So, thank you very much for watching this video. Hope you have got an overview about geothermal energy conversion system. In the next class, we will be solving the problems and few mathematical approach for designing a geothermal power plant. So, thank you very much. Thank you.